All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Leibovitz. I'm the Associate Dean of the Math Department, and I will be conducting this final exam review for MAT 0028. Uh, for those of you watching online, hi. Yes, we are filming, and this will be posted online for people to be able to view. The final exam review should be available in your course shells in D2L, and it should also be available uh, through the ASC at the Math Lab website. If you have any questions about getting a copy of the review, please ask your instructor. They have received copies of them. So we can do this a couple of different ways. We can go through page by page, or I can take questions about specific topics. The most important thing is, for those of you that are here, I want to review what you feel you need to review. So what would you guys like to do? Kind of page by page? Okay. So page one, uh, we can break up in a couple of different categories. We have some order of operations, absolute value, combining like terms, evaluating expressions, and properties of the real numbers. So anything on there that you guys look at and really are unsure what to do. Mm -hmm. Can you go over the, the first one? Number one? Yes. All right, number one. Eight minus four divided by two minus 10 divided by two. I'll try to write clearly. I don't have the best handwriting, but I will do my best. All right, so this problem is about what? What is this problem about? PEMDAS. PEMDAS, order of operations. All right, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. That's a D. P stands for? Parentheses. Parentheses. Exponents, Exponents. Multiplication. multiplication and division. That's a single operation. Multiplication and division, how? Uh, From left to right. And then addition and subtraction also from left to right. So what are we going to do first here? Divide 4 by 2. We're going to do the first division from left to right. Because there are no parentheses, there are no exponents. So we're going to the box. That becomes 8 minus 4 divided by 2 is 2 minus 10 divided by 2. Then what? Divide 10 by 2. Again, we have more multiplication or division from left to right. So that becomes 8 minus 2 minus 10 divided by 2 is 5. And then addition and subtraction from left to right. So we're going to subtract there. So 8 minus 2 six. is 6, minus 5, of course, is 1. Now, having been involved with the writing of the actual exam you guys are going to take, I can tell you that if you go straight from left to right on a problem like this, and you don't follow the order of operations, that answer will be on the test. Well, one, it will be wrong, and two, it will be on the test. All right, so you got to know what you're doing. All right, any other order of operations questions you'd like to go over? Um, yes. So number two, is is there still one understood between the division and the parentheses? No. Well. You could say so, but I wouldn't think of it that way. Two bracket parentheses, four minus six squared minus eight. Now, just to explain, first of all, these are curly brackets, which I do not write well. And the reason for the different types of parentheses and brackets here is just so you can know where something starts and where something ends. What's the left parenthesis? What's the right parenthesis on any one part of the problem? Okay? So here, uh, parentheses first, always from the inside out. So the first thing we're going to do 
is that all the way on the inside is the 4 minus 6. So this is 12 divided by 2 bracket, and then the parentheses 4 minus 6 is negative 2 squared minus 8 bracket curly bracket. Now what? Got to do the exponent. Because when the P in parentheses, the P for parentheses in PEMDAS, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, really means go into the parentheses and then do everything else in the right order. So once you get inside the parentheses, then it's um, do everything in the right order. So now, really, what parentheses we have are here, because there's really no operation in this. So we're inside this set of brackets. So what would we do first? The exponent. Yes. So this becomes divided by 2 times negative 2 squared is negative 2 times negative 2 four. is positive 4 minus 8. And then inside those brackets or parentheses is negative 2 times negative 4. Now we're just multiplying here. So this is 12 divided by negative 8. And if you want to just think of that as a fraction, this is just 12 over negative 8, which would reduce to negative divided out of 4, negative 3 halves. All right. Don't let these, I know it looks kind of funky, mm -hmm. all right, but this exact same problem could very easily be written by like this. Two times four minus six squared minus eight. In fact, let me, let me do this a little bit there. All right, what I did was I replaced the curly brackets with green parentheses mm -hmm. and the square brackets with red parentheses. Now, let me write it again now in all black. When you have all those nested parentheses, is what that's called, parentheses within parentheses, within parentheses, parentheses, excuse me, it gets hard to see where one stops and where one ends. It's really easy in color, but we can't print necessarily in color, so this was the option we went with. We think this is a better option than this is for something like that. Does that make sense? It looks funky, but if you just, just realize it doesn't matter what the shape looks like, but you know where one starts and where one ends. Yes. I think, I don't know if that's clear, but could I ask you a question about rules of integers for exponents? Can you, can you like quickly like make the rules so I can we'll, we'll, down we'll get to that. Yeah? We'll get to that. Right. Number nine, I want to keep in order, yes. Um, was number five, we used the distributive property? Yes, number five is a fairly simple problem. I think, and I say simple now at this point of the course, now that you guys have done so much work. Three times x plus two y, plus 4 times 2x minus 5y. This is just a matter of distributing and then combining like terms properly. Yeah. So distribute the 3, so that's 3x plus 6y, make sure you multiply properly, plus distribute the 4, and we get 8x minus 20y. And we have x's we can combine, and we have y's that we can combine as well. So 3x plus 8x is 11x. Remember, think of these as objects. It's not x squared. Mm -hmm. right? 3x is in one pocket. 8x is in the other pocket. It means you're walking around with 11x's. And then uh, 6y's minus 20y's. So 6 minus 20 is negative 14. And then the y. 
All right, for problems like seven and eight where it says evaluate and you're given an expression when a variable equals a number, all you do is plug in and then do the arithmetic, do the order of operations, all right? You plug in A for whatever number for A into A, B, C, Z, X, Y, P, Q, doesn't matter. Um, number 10, when you change the order of addition, what is it, what property is that? It's that three plus x equals x plus three. That's commutative. Okay. The way to remember how I use the associative property and the commutative property to remember. Um, commutative. What's the root word of commutative? Commute. Commutes. Right. Commute means to move or to travel. Right. You commute to school. You commute to work. What does that mean? It means it moves. So if you have 3 plus x equals x plus 3, what happened to the relative position of the 3 and the x? They moved. So that's the commutative property. The associative property, what's the root word of associative? Associate. Associate. So who are you associating with? So that would be a plus B plus C, in like that in parentheses, equals A plus B plus C. When I used to teach high school, the way I would teach this to students to get them to remember is, you know how high school is, and this person said something about that person's boyfriend, and you know, all of a sudden people start fighting, and they don't want to talk about really petty nonsense. So I used to say that Ann, Annie used to be friends with Betty, but not friends with Kathy, but then Betty heard something that Annie did, so now Betty is hanging out with Kathy, but not with Annie. So it's who is Betty associating with? That's why it's in the parentheses. All right, use the, the language to your advantage. Don't try to memorize and guess. Yes? I have a question about number nine. Uh, okay. The only problem is differentiating between whole numbers and real numbers. Well, those are very different. All right, whole numbers, is actually what that problem is about. To set 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Those are whole numbers. Um, I'll go through these. Natural numbers is 1, 2, 3, and so on. Integers. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. All right, so those are the whole numbers plus the negative of everything. The real numbers I cannot write for you down as a set like this. The real numbers are everything. Every decimal, every fraction, uh, no matter how long, whether it ends or not, everything that you guys know of is a real number. All right? Six, nine fifths, 0 0.751, the square root of two, pi. All of those are real numbers. Real numbers are everything. Anything that's on the number line, all right, is a real number. But there is another category, right? Outside the real number? Yes, but you haven't covered that in this class. There's something called complex numbers. That's correct, uh, but that'll be in the next class. For now, everything that you know is a real number, as far as this class is concerned, okay? okay? It's like my, my kid, my kid's in fourth grade, right? As far as he knows, everything's a positive number because he hasn't learned about negative numbers yet, all right? Well, he, he knows because I tell him these things, but yeah, let's not confuse the issue with what we know is not going to be on the exam. All right, the next page. All right, 11 to 19, we've got solving linear equations. We've got a word problem. We have solving literal equations. That's the ones with all the variables. And then we have uh, conversions. 
Hold on one second. I did not silence my phone. That is so stupid. All right. Um, is there a specific number or topic again? Solving the linear equations. Is there one that you want to go over more than any other? Um, just the general idea that you you uh, solve it on one side and then it. What is it? You solve the uh, just an example. The first one you use the distributive property and then. Um, all right, so, okay, so let's go through all of this. Well, you're not solving for set. Remember, you're solving for the variable. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you're going to do is, if you need to distribute, you're going to distribute. Right? If you have something you have to multiply, you're going to do that. Then what are you going to do? Let me solve for the variable. So okay, solve for, that's very global. But what comes next in that process? So strikes, no, no, no. You're, now you're talking specific to this problem. Oh. All right. So you've distributed potentially on one side or the other, and you may not have to do that. What? You just solve it. Okay, but what? All right. I if I tell my kid, um, okay, go build a model. But what's the process in building that model? Not so much order of operations. After you potentially multiply, then you're going to look to combine like terms on either side. After you've combined like terms, then you're going to isolate the variable. You want all the variable terms on one side, all the non-variable terms on the other side and then you proceed to solve. All right, if you can explain that process, then you'll be able to do that process. So let's take something like number 14. Number 14 kind of has it all. Two times x plus three plus seven equals negative two times three x plus five, and then plus five. So, we want to simplify each side of the equation. That process is distribute if necessary, and then combine like terms if necessary. It's not always necessary to do these things, but if they're there, you have to do them. So we're gonna distribute the two here. That gives us two x plus six, and then plus seven. Remember, this seven is outside the parentheses, so the two does not distribute to the seven. Then we multiply the negative two, and we get negative six x minus 10 plus five. Then we look, okay, we have like terms here. We have like terms here. We want to get like terms before we start moving stuff around. I would refer to this as clutter, right? We've got a lot of clutter here. We've got a lot of stuff. So if we can organize it a little bit and have less clutter, it's gonna make the problem look easier. So we have two x, and then six plus seven is 13. And we have the negative six x, and negative 10 plus five is negative five. So that, we've simplified both sides of the equation. Nice, now which, would you agree that this looks easier than that first step? Absolutely. So we don't wanna move stuff around until you've kind of organized the process. So now we want to get all the variable terms on one side, all the non-variable terms on the other side. So what can we do here? Okay, but how do I do that? Right, inverse operations. So much of what you guys do in this class is inverse operations. How do you get rid of a negative six x? By adding. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. So 2x plus 6x is 8x plus 13 equals negative 5. And since we brought the variables to the left, that means we want to get the numbers where? To the right. On the right, on the other side. So we get rid of a positive 13 by subtracting 13. So that gives us 8x is negative... 
Now here, what's being done to x? Multiply. It's being multiplied. So how do we undo multiplication? Divide. Division. So we divide both sides by 8. These cancel. And when we simplify, we can divide out a common factor of 2 there. And we get negative 9 fourths. Or if you want the solution set is negative 9 fourths. So you guys should make sure you recognize that. Okay? If you can do that one, you can pretty much do any of them. I do, however, want to talk about number 15. Because number 15 is potentially a little funky. All right, now, sometimes I always encourage students, you know, well, first of all, you know, back to this problem, you, you know, you can always plug it in and check it, make sure it's right. But you want to look at the answers before you start doing all your work. And I'm going to write down number 15, and then I'm going to write down the answer so everyone can see them. 3 times x plus 2 minus 5 equals 4x minus x plus 1. And the answers are a, 2, b, all real numbers, c is the empty set, and D is a solution of negative 1. Now, the fact that the problem has either one of these two answers, B or C, all real numbers or no solution, should let you know that it's possible you're going to get something funky on this problem. All right, that bell should go off. But let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and solve the problem here. So we're going to, again, simplify on both sides. So we're going to distribute the 3. So we get 3x plus 6 minus 5. And this one's a little tricky. We get the 4x, and then what? Yeah, what? The, 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 the negative is um, distributed in the parentheses. Yeah. Excellent. So think of this as having a 1 here. Whenever you have a minus and then something in parentheses without a coefficient, right, without a number in front, think of it as a 1 and then distribute that negative 1. That's, believe me, you're going to see that some, in at least one place, if not more than one, on the exam. So you distribute the negative 1 and you get negative x negative one. minus 1. Very good. So now we can combine like terms. 6 minus 5 is 1. And then 4x minus x is 3x minus 1. Okay. Now, I always like to focus on the variables first. Right? You're supposed to be solving for the variable. That's where I'm going to put my effort in first. I always advise students to do that. So I'm going to decide to move my variables over to the left. So if I subtract 3x from both sides, wait a minute. What Notice what happens here. They both cancel. That can happen. Not wrong with that. That can absolutely happen. So we get something that 1 is equal to negative 1. Now. I said, why did you put x? Where? You have um, one this line? Eight. No. Oh. This line? No, the, the, when you plug one with uh, minus one with x plus one. Very top. This one? Yeah. Well, why did I put the one here? No, the, yeah, the x. This x was part of the problem. Okay. If you look on the, on the test, number 15, the x is part of the problem. Because of the parentheses, so they... Whoa, wait, hold, hold on, I don't... The original problem had a 4x minus, and then parentheses, x plus 1. It's in the problem. I okay. didn't put anything. Okay, uh, okay. You subtract it. Uh, I'm talking about the second one. You subtract it to uh, form 4. For x. Well, the 4x is there. Okay. And then distribute the negative. Mm -hmm. So negative 1 times x is negative x. Oh, okay. Negative 1 times positive 1 is negative 1. Yeah. Got it? Oh, yeah. Excellent. All right, so back to this. 
When is one equal to negative one? Never. Never. That's the perfect answer. This is never true. Now, if you think about, and this is something you're taught, but it doesn't get emphasized a lot. Any solution to a problem, to an equation, to an inequality, really anything, is something that you can plug back in and the equation or inequality will be true. But in this case, this is never true. So there's nothing I can plug in for x that will give me a true statement, ever. So if I can't plug in anything and get a true statement, and a solution is everything that will give me a true statement, that means there is no answer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the solution is the list of things that will make this true. Okay. Nothing will do this. So because this is never true, there is no solution. Um, isn't one of the answers though, people who write it out? Well, it would be the empty set. Yeah. So it would be yeah. zero. No, that's not zero. That's the empty set. Okay. Okay, that just... means there is no solution. It can also be written as quite literally an empty set. A set with nothing in it. Now, what would an answer be for the... Um, all, all real numbers? Yeah. I'm about to get to them. All right? So let's say, for instance, let's say the problem came out, you're working on an equation, da, 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 and you get seven equals seven, or some number equals itself. Mm -hmm. You get the same number on both sides. When is a number equal to itself? Always. This is always mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. Which means, if a statement is always true, you can plug anything you want into that equation to get a true statement. Anything and everything will make this true. So if everything will make it true, that means everything is a solution. Now, what did I, we just talked a couple minutes ago. As far as you guys are concerned, everything is what kind of number? Any real number. A real number. So any real number, anything at all, can be plugged in and get a true statement. So this is when you get all real numbers as an answer. So when are you going to get one of these two solutions? Rarely. Well, that's true. But what, what's going to happen in the math? The variable is just, it, it'll cancel itself out. That's correct. When the variable term cancels itself out and it drops out of the problem completely, then you know you're going to have one of these two answers. If what remains is never true, then it's no solution. If what remains is always true, then it's all real numbers. I have a question. The no solution of the empty slot, is that a typical sign? Will that be? Oh, absolutely. It, it could very well be on the test, yes. Okay. I, I've been using it for the answer zero, just Man. because it differentiates from the variable O. No, mo we tend to avoid variable O's. Okay. I know I always do on my test. I never give a variable of O for that very reason. All right, so that's linear equations. Um, anything else on this page, 16 and 19? Can we have 16? 16. I know you guys see word problems, and <laughs> oh, the sweat starts pouring, and you get nervous, you get that kind of nauseous feeling. All right. If four out of every seven groundhogs carry a gene for a defective enzyme, So let me write some of this down for the audience at home. Four out of, whoops, be nice if I can spell. Four out of seven are defective. How many groundhogs carry the defective gene in a population of 840 groundhogs? Set up an equation and solve. Does anyone know what kind of equation this is? It is absolutely a proportion. A ratio is actually part of a proportion. A proportion is an equation involving two ratios. But the correct term, this is a proportion. Now, the best way to set up a proportion 
is to set up the words first, not the numbers. So what are we talking about here? What are the words we need to be concerned about? Groundhogs. Well, yes, well, everything's groundhogs. But what about the groundhogs? Defective genes. They're defective, and we also have a total. Okay, but we have a total amount. So I'm going to set this up. So we've got defective out of a total and defective out of a total. Now the words are everything here. Without the words, then all you're doing is putting numbers down in some random order. So what can we set up, say, in this first fraction? Our original ratio. Which is? Is um, four, four, out of seven. Four. four defective out of seven. a total of seven. Mm -hmm. This is just like a percentages. It's very similar to a percentage problem. Yes. All right. What about this one? That's that's the total. We don't know how many defective. Yeah. That's what the question is asking. How many groundhogs carry the defective gene out of? A total of 840. So once you've got that down, then drop the words and just do the math. So this becomes 4 sevenths equals x out of 840. Well, right, we're going to cross multiply is the easiest way to do this. Yeah. And we get 4 times 840 equals 7x. Now from here there are two different ways to do this. You can go ahead and multiply, and I'll do that. So that's going to be uh, 06, 3360 equals 7x. And then you divide by 7, so now you have to do long division. So 7 goes into 3,360. And by the way, I don't expect you to multiply that as fast as I did. If you need to write it out and do the multiplication out, do that. So 7 goes into 33 four times, minus 28, 56. And then 7 goes into 56 eight times. So you get the 0, so the answer would be 480. I'm going to show you a little trick on the arithmetic here. I want to go back to this step here. 4 times 840 equals 7x. Believe it or not, you don't have to multiply. You can divide first. And the trick here is knowing some of the arithmetic. That 7 goes into 84. Anyone know how many times? Mm -hmm. Nine times. Thirteen times? No. Eight times. Twelve times. <laughs> Seven times twelve is eighty-four. So this cancels and gives us 120. Now if it was an easier number, you might notice it a little bit better. But notice now that I can just multiply four times 120. And get 480. It's a little trick that makes some of the arithmetic a little bit easier. Even if you had to do this long division, I think this long division is easier than that long division. So you can always divide first. Make the numbers smaller before they get bigger. All right. Let's go ahead and do 17 as well. I think that's a problem that students have a lot of issues with. So this is solve for z. And the equation is k times y plus m times z equals ab. Now before when we were solving linear equations, and I emphasize the language, 
What's the first step? What's the second step? If you know that in words, this problem becomes very easy. Right? So we're solving for z. So we talked about if we have to distribute or combine like terms, we need to do that first. So is there anything here to distribute or combine like terms? No. 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 Nothing. What was the step after that? Add uh, ky to both Well, sides. hold on. You're getting specific here. I want, I want to talk generally. <laughs> we already taught this. We don't have combining like terms. What came after combining like terms? Solve. Solve it. Yes, that's the general <laughs> direction. <laughs> Isolate the variable. If you, if you want to solve C, you need to what, move like everything to the other side. Yes. We want to isolate the variable. That's correct. We want to get everything with that variable on one side and everything without that variable on the other side. Okay, so we're going to keep the variable here, right? We're solving for z. Mm -hmm. So that means what do we have to move? Yeah. Everything else. Before the m. Right? Because don't forget, don't we add or subtract stuff to both sides generally before we divide? Yes. All right, you want to keep that process in mind. So we need to get this ky over to the other side. How do we do that? We subtract. Yeah, we Hold on. Time out. Time out. Forget the other variables and turn them into numbers. What would you do there? Subtract. I would subtract 8. You subtract the 8. Mm -hmm. Subtract the ky. Remember, here's the maybe here's the hard part. This is one term because it's being multiplied. Don't think of this as two different things. Although technically it is. You really want to think of it as one thing. So we subtract ky. So we end up with m times z equals, and what do we get here? A b minus ky. Right. You know how to do that? Read. You just read what it says, A, B minus K1. So then what do you write? A, B minus K1. But you just read it. And then remember, we're still solving for Z. And here Z is being multiplied, multiplied by M. So how do we undo multiplication by M? Divide. Divide by yeah. M, by that coefficient. Those cancel. If z equals a b minus k times y over m. Once you understand and accept that this equation really is no different from this equation, you're going to be a lot better off. But you're going to do the same process, right? You're going to add or subtract first, then you're going to divide. Doesn't change. All right. Any others on that page? Oh, number 18. When I did it, I got um, D. Was that the right answer? No, the correct answer is A. Yeah, I can tell you right now looking at it that D is not correct. All right. All right, so 18. We're going to solve for A. So A over B minus C equals D. Okay. All right, so what did you do first? I um, multiplied, to get, I, to get rid of the, um, that fraction, I multiplied B on the side. Okay. You think that's what you did. That's what you tried to do. But that's not really what you did. I'll tell you exactly what you did. I mean, you had the right idea. The idea was, was perfect. It was the implementation. You did this. You said those cancel. And you have A minus C equals B D. Right? Mm -hmm. Did he multiply both sides by B? No. No, you didn't. The way to do it. Minus B C. Now we're 
multiplying the whole side by B. You just multiplied one term on the left by B. So if we distribute, then we get B times A over B minus BC equals BD. If you want to think of this as B over 1, you can, then those cancel. So now you get A minus BC equals BD. Then you would add BC to both sides. So you get A equals BD plus BC. I believe the correct answer is listed, though, as BC plus BD. Right? Either one of those two is acceptable because addition is commutative. Do you see what you did wrong? Do you understand? Yeah. Now, the other way to do this, and this is perfectly fine, uh, is, I mean, we, we tell you guys all the time, if you don't like fractions, then get rid of them. And so that taking that process of clearing fractions first is never a wrong step. But there is an alternative. Since this is the only fraction involved, we can get it by itself by adding C to both sides. And we get A over B equals C plus D. And then if we multiply both sides by B, and these cancel, we get A equals B times C plus D, or A equals when we distribute BC plus BD. That's how I do it. Either one is perfectly acceptable. There's, n there's nothing right or better about either one. The thing about it is someone like me who does this for a living, I can look at it and I can pretty much instantly tell you which is probably going to be the easier method to avoid certain mistakes. But you guys, that's... You guys are still, you know, you're learning this stuff, you know it, but you can't look at it like we can and just instantly analyze everything. All right, so what you did is perfectly fine. You just have to be careful that you put that whole side in parentheses and then distribute. Okay? All right, let's move on to page three. We've got some word problems. We've got some percentages and some inequalities. Okay, can you pick one? Twenty-one. Perimeter of a triangle. All right, I'm going to read this to the folks at home. I'm not going to write the whole thing down, but I will draw the diagram. A triangle is such that its medium side is three times as long as its shortest side and its longest side is five inches longer than four times its shortest side. The perimeter of the triangle is 69 inches. Find the length of the medium side of the triangle. All right, so let's draw a triangle. And we're gonna label these as small, medium, and large. Now there's a little trick I always tell my students when how to label what in a diagram. And the rule is the variable always gets assigned to whatever the second item mentioned is. So in the sentence or in the phrase, its medium side is three times as long as its shortest side. The medium side is three times as long as the shortest side. What is the second item that I mentioned? The shortest side. The shortest side. So that's my variable. So I'm going to call it the shortest side or the smallest side x. So the medium side is three times the shortest side. So if the, me if the smallest side is x, what's the medium size? Three times x. At three times x or three x. Then, the longest side is five inches longer than four times the shortest side. 
So the shortest side of the smallest side is x. So how do we write 5 inches longer than 4 times its shortest side? And that would be 5 plus 4x or 4x plus 5. All right, so it's 5 longer than 4 times its shortest side. Right? The 5, the 5 longer really implies what? I want to emphasize this. Plus five. Is going to be plus 5. So this one you're going to add 5. And then 4 times means it's multiplied by 5. Or by 4, excuse me. Now, in this case, it doesn't matter which way you write that, 5 plus 4x or 4x plus 5. But if you had a problem that talked about less than, 5 less than, let's say it said that. Let's say it said 5 less than 4 times the shortest side. What would the expression be? Subtraction. Okay, specifically, what would it be? What would, what would be subtraction, but what would it be? Negative 4x minus 5. Negative 5 minus 4. Okay, here's the issue. Some of you are saying 5 minus 4x, and some of you are saying 4x minus 5. One is right, one is wrong. And this is the right one. This is wrong. And think of it this way. Whenever you have trouble with the language, put it in everyday terms and use objects or money. All right? Um, I have $8. My friend has $5 less than me. How much money does my friend have? $3. $3. Everyone gets that? If I have $8, then he has $5 less than me. All right? How'd you get the three? What did you subtract from? So tell me exactly how to write that arithmetic. Is it 8 minus 5 or is it 5 minus 8? 8 minus 5. So the 5 less than has to be subtracted on the back end, not the front end. Does that make sense? So that's why here, that's, I want to make sure you guys understand this. Right, if it's addition, the order doesn't matter. If it's subtraction, the order does. With um, subtracting, it's the first number is the position on the number line, and the second number is the direction and distance you're going. That's true, but this is very different than that. This is very different than that. All right, so I want to make sure you guys know this. All right, so now we come back to our diagram, back to our problem. And it says the perimeter of the triangle is 69 inches. How do you find the perimeter of any shape? Uh, no, no, no. Any shape. It's the side of there. Add up the sides. There's no formula for perimeter. You can think of perimeter of a rectangle as 2L plus 2W. But to keep it simple, to find the perimeter of any shape, you just add up the sides, okay? You can think of it this way. The soldier walks the perimeter of the base for security reasons. So whatever the shape of the base is, he's going to walk along every line, round, straight, curved, right? Doesn't matter. So how would you figure out how far the soldier walked? So he walked this way 100 yards, and he walked that way 50 yards, and then you'd add them all up. All right? Make sense? All right, so we're going to add these. x plus 3x plus 4x plus 5 is 69 inches. So we can combine like terms. x plus 3x plus 4x is 8x plus 5 is 69. Subtract the 5. So 8x is 64. Divide by 8. So x is 8. So? Is 
Is that the answer? Eight? That's easy. That's one of the options. Mm -hmm. It's not the right answer. All right. Random person comes up to you on the street. What's the answer? Don't look at that. I'm a, a random person on the street. Some random person comes up to you and says, what's the answer? Eight. I don't know. What's the answer? What's the answer? Remember, I'm just some random person walking me up on the street. Mm -hmm. What's the answer? answer between four. Four. Right. Right. <laughs> This. Okay. Forget this. Okay. Forget this. This does not exist. I, don't, I, don't, I would say I don't know. Random what? person comes up to you. What's the answer? Answer to what? What's the question? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's right. Answer to what? <laughs> so what's the question? <laughs> That's what you got to ask. That's what you got to think. So looking back at the problem now. Oh, no, it's good, though. What's the question? <laughs> what's the question? Find the length of the medium side. So the question is, really, what's the length of the medium side? It doesn't say, the question is not, what's X? No. Right? And I work, whenever I teach word problems, even with my kid, and he's trained now, when I ask him, what's the answer? He'll come back to me, what's the question? <laughs> Right? Because you got to answer what's being asked. So if they want the medium side, we know the medium side is 3x. So the medium side is 3 times x, which is 8, which is 24. Okay, yes, you had the right answer a while ago, and I want to recognize that, but I want to make sure everyone understands it's not about finding x unless that's the question. All right, let's do, um, let's do 22. All right, Jamal buys his clothes at super discounts. On Saturday, he bought shoes regularly priced at $40 for 25% off, and a jacket regularly priced at $100 for 30% off. Including a 6% sales tax, what total amount will Jamal pay? All right, so, so the first part, he bought something at $40, this is number 22, at 25% off. So what do we do here? Thoughts? We multiply 40 by 0 0.25, 0 0.025, that's what I mean. Okay, so you're thinking like the is over of equals percent over 100. I don't recommend that for these particular problems. For, for most other percentage problems, I do, where it says what is so much of a percent of something else and all that, then I do. But for these, I just recommend just going ahead and doing the multiplication. Right, now, there are two ways to do this. We can multiply 40 times 0.25, right, because it's 25% off. And when we do that, okay, I'll let you guys work out. Well, let me show you. You get 0, 5 times 4 is 20, and we get the 0 placer. 2 times 0 is 0. 2 times 4 is 8. We add... And our answer must have two total decimal places. So one, two, and we get just 10. Now what does that 10 represent? 10% off. No, 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 it's not 10% off. No, it's 0 25 off. Oh, hold, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. 25% off. What is this $10? What is the 25 from 40? The 25% Okay, 40. but in terms of the problem, oh, what is this that's, $10? That's how much money was the discount? This is the discount, that's correct. So how do you figure out how much he paid? You subtract. You subtract, right? It was 40 minus the discount means he paid $30. All right, the next part 
is it's a hundred dollars at thirty percent off. So we can do this one the exact same way. And one hundred times point three zero, I'm going to just do that quickly and say it comes out to exactly thirty. You guys can do the multiplication on your own. So this again is the discount. So 100 minus 30 means it's $70 paid. So uh, Jamal paid $30 for the shoes and $70 for the jacket. So how much did he pay total? He paid the 30 plus the 70, I heard someone say it, is 100. Then, what do we have to account for? We have to account for the sales tax. So, there are a couple different ways to do this. Depends on how you've been taught. Now, were you guys taught to calculate the original price in with the tax or just calculate the tax separately? I mean, is that okay, like what, what are you going to multiply by? Let me ask you that. If there's 6% sales tax. By 0 0.06. Oh, okay, so you guys are doing it that way. Uh, so like, what, what, like if it's 100 and you're taking like 6%, so you can say 6 like right away. That's true, okay? okay. That 100 times 0 0.06. Well, because the word percent, do know what the word percent means? What the literal meaning is? No. Okay, per means of, or out of, and cent. Well, where do we see the word cent in language? Cents. In money. Yeah. Cents. How many cents are in a dollar? No. That was a question. Oh. Don't not. How many cents are in a dollar? A hundred. A hundred. How many centimeters are in a meter? Hundred. Okay. Percent means of a hundred. So what six percent of a hundred is just six. Nine percent of a hundred is nine. Forty-three percent of a hundred is forty-three. Okay, so the hundred really makes life easier. So this is six dollars in tax. So then the real total is 100 plus 6 is $106. All right, I'm going to show you a little trick here with the discounts. Because I don't do it that way most of the time. The way I look at it is if something is 25% off, how much is left? 75. 75%, right? If you're not paying for 25%, you're paying for the remaining 75%. And if you take 40 and multiply by 0 0.75, 5 times 0 is 0, 5 times 4 is 20, put the 0 placeholder, 7 times 0 is 0, 7 times 4 is 28, we get 0, 0, we get 10, carry the 1 is 3, we need two decimal places. So what do we get as an answer? $30 paid. What do we get as the answer here? $30 paid. It's the same thing. So you avoid one step if you do it though. Yes, there's one less arithmetic step. It's also helpful if you recognize 25% is one fourth. Anyone think of that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it's a quarter off, a quarter of 40 is ten dollars right if you just do one if you do 40 times one fourth I don't expect a lot of students to do that <laughs> right that was something I, I was forced to learn at a very young age in middle school we had to learn fractions and decimals and percentages and know them all backwards and forwards to this day it still helps in certain classes all right so let's go ahead and move on and you can do the same thing by the way here and you can actually do the same thing here instead of adding here. Because if you're paying 6% tax, you're also paying 100, hold on, you're paying 
just in the total. So if you multiply by 1.06, that'll give you 106. All right? That one doesn't tend to be as advantageous as these are. I think doing, the, doing this one, I think, can be a good advantage. All right, anything about the inequality? So let's go ahead and look at the inequalities. 24 to 27. Excuse me while they step off screen and get something drink. If you're a first senator and can do it on live television, I can do it on YouTube. All right, questions on the inequalities? 25. All right, 25, with, is it the interval notation that kind of worries you? All right, so 25, we have 2x plus 1 is less than 3x plus 4. This is a good one to, for us to practice. And I'm going to do this one two different ways. So again, I like to focus on the variables. So let's say you guys really like to put your variables on the left. Fine, let's do it that way. Subtract 3x from both sides. 2x minus 3x is negative x plus 1 is less than 4. So we're going to subtract 1. We get negative x is less than 3. Well, this x is not solved for. We don't have x by itself here. What do we have to do? Add in the both sides. Oh, no, we're not going to add here. I mean, uh, the minus is going to go that way. I mean, that's how I see it. <laughs> but what algebra are we going to do to make the minus go that way? Divide. We're going to either multiply or divide by negative 1. And here, then, a negative divided by a negative is positive. Here, 3 divided by negative 1 is negative 3. And then what happens with the inequalities? It switch. switches. Remember, when you multiply or divide by a negative, then you have to switch the direction of that inequality. All right, so now the answers here all have to do with interval notation. So we need to graph this. I think the easiest way to come up with the interval is to do the graph first, even though it may not be necessary as part of the answer, and then find the interval. So if we graph the interval, all I do with my number line is I just put the numbers I need. I just need a negative 3. Don't put all these extra numbers on there. Just going to confuse you. So first of all, is this inclusive or non-inclusive on the negative 3? Is the negative 3 part of the solution or not? It is. Mm -hmm. Why? Because x is greater than negative 3. So is negative 3 greater than negative 3? Uh, no. No. Do you want to revise your answer? I don't know what's going on. It's <laughs> not included if this was an equal to, a greater than. Oh. Greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to, then we would include the negative 3. Mm -hmm. So depending on how your instructor does it, and I know Alex does it a different way, this is going to be either an open circle or parentheses. And then greater than, we're going to shade to the right. And then it goes to infinity. So we're going to have our parentheses. Notice how I put the parentheses right under the number line in the right place. And then since my shading is to the right, it's going to go to infinity on the right. Now, how do I know if this is positive, positive infinity or negative infinity? Because it's positive. It's positive. Why is it positive? Because it's x is bigger than minus 3. No. Well, it's going to the right. It's to the is right side. positive numbers or negative numbers? Positive. Right is positive. If it went to the left, negative. that would be negative. And then do we put a bracket or a parenthesis on infinities? Correct. Always a parenthesis. All right, and that's going to be D. Letter choice, letter D. Now, I do want to talk about this. There's a little issue here with this problem that can mess you up. Not because of math, but because of grammar. Believe it or not, it's grammar. It's not math. Let's 
say, excuse me? Someone say something or have a question? Yeah, because I think you probably to take um, minus three for 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 the nine and three. That's really good. No, because it's some of the are you talking about here? Why is it a yeah. negative three? No, um, when you shed it, I think you. No, because it's greater than. X is greater than. Greater than is always to the right. And it's greater than because when you divide here by a negative, you have to switch the direction of the inequality. Okay? All right, so here, let's say you, let's say you recognize, okay, if I subtract the 3x, 2 minus 3, that's a negative. Oh, I hate negatives. So I'm going to go ahead and put the x on the other side by subtracting the 2x. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly acceptable. You get 1 is less than x plus 4. Then you subtract the 4. And you get negative 3 is less than x. And there are some of you that are going to say, oh, wonderful. I've solved this. I can set this up. I have got my negative 3. And I've got a less than. So I'm going to shade to the left. But that's not what we got before. And the answer, the, the issue here is not math, it's grammar. If I tell you to solve for x, and I tell you to give me your answer in a complete sentence, how are you going to start your sentence? X is. All right? Something in grammar uh, with nouns. The subject versus an object. All right? The subject is the thing doing the action. And the object is the thing related to the action. So in this case, x is greater than negative 3. x is the subject, negative 3 is the object. But here, you've got them backwards. All right? I'm asking you what is x. You should tell me x is. You shouldn't tell me negative 3 is. I don't care what negative 3 is. I care what x is. So you need to change this. All right? Come here for a second. I'm going to borrow someone from the audience. Come here. Yes, you're going to be on TV for the world to say us. Okay. <laughs> What's your name again? Diego. Diego. Okay, Diego. Everyone would agree Diego is taller than I am. Is that correct? Yes. Not by much, but Diego is taller than I am. Now, what if we switch places? Then I am shorter. Shorter, than. shorter than Diego. So when we switch places, the adjective changes. Even though our relationship didn't change, he's still taller, but you can also say I'm shorter. All right, thank you. So instead of saying <laughs> negative 3 is less than x, okay, if negative 3 is shorter than x, that would mean x is bigger. Bigger or so taller uh -huh. or greater than negative. Uh -huh. negative three, which does match what we got before. So from, to get from here to here, I didn't do any math. I just changed my language around. It's like I picked it up, turn around, and put it right back down on the page. All right? I've had students ask me so many times over the years, well, what algebra did you do here? Nothing. I simply, I simply reworded my sentence. That's it. But I guarantee you, you'll, if you set, do this algebra, you can do your algebra 100% right. And it's the grammar of your sentence that's going to cause you to get the wrong answer. Which is why I always recommend to students when you're solving an inequality like this, always make sure your variable is on the left that avoids this issue. Okay? Alright. Um, do you guys want to go over some of the other problems or can we talk about just... Uh, remember with uh, interval notation and graphing lines, if you have an equal to, right, less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, what changes? 
bracket. The parentheses will become a bracket. So if it has an equal to, you're going to have a square bracket. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's try to move on to some of the harder stuff. Exponents. You wanted to talk before about rules of exponents, correct? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is uh, 28 through 63 is the page that we're on. So rules of exponents. We're going to have rule one, that x to the a times x to the b is x to the a plus b. When you multiply it like bases, you add the exponents. Rule two, x to the a over x to the b equals x to the a minus b. When you subtract like bases, or excuse me, when you divide like bases, you subtract the exponents. Rule three, that x to the a to the b power is x to the a times b power. When you have a power to a power, you multiply the exponents. Rule four, that x to the minus a is one over x to the a. So when you have a negative exponent, you apply it and you get the reciprocal. Alright, any problem in particular you would like to go over on this sheet? Yeah, number. What number? Number 20. 32. 32. Okay. Now there are a couple of different ways to do these problems. First I'll show you just using the rules and then I'll show you my preferred method of doing these problems. So 32, we have x to the minus 3, y to the 6th, over x to the minus 4, y to the 4. So here we're dividing x's and we're dividing y's. So we're going to use rule 2 twice. So this becomes x to the negative 3 minus negative 4 power. When we divide like bases, we subtract the exponents, top minus bottom. And then times y to the 6 minus 4. So minus a negative here becomes plus a positive. So this becomes negative 3 plus 4 is 1, which we can write, we don't have to. And then 6 minus 4 is 2. So the answer that we're more likely going to see is x times y squared. Right, which is choice A. But that's not how I like to do this problem. Personally, I hate the division rule. I hate rule two. Why? Because number one of things that students in this class do not like and maybe aren't the best at is fractions. The second thing that students in this class do not like and maybe aren't the best at is adding and subtracting positive and negative numbers. Do you guys agree with that? I've been teaching this class here for a long time. Probably close to 10 years I've been teaching this class. And that's been my experience. I think you guys would agree with me. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to apply rule, rule, four, that rule 4 first. Get rid of those negative exponents. And then just cancel. Just reduce your fraction. So again, if I start the problem again, x to the negative 3, y to the 6, over x to the negative 4, y to the 4. The rule is, anything with a negative exponent gets flipped. Top to bottom, or bottom to top. Anything we flip? With a negative exponent. All right. So there's a song from my youth 
right? Should I stay or should I go? Right? Song by the Clash. So we go through each factor, should it stay or should it go? Right? Should we, should we move, should we flip it or should we leave it alone? All right, x of the negative three. Mm -hmm. It's got to flip. So that becomes x of the third. Y to the sixth. Stay. Stays. Because it's a positive exponent. It's not going to go anywhere. X to the negative four. Mm -hmm. Flips. Flips. Yeah. Moves. Y to the fourth. Stays. Stays. No more negatives. I'm going to rewrite that to kind of put the like variables on top of one another. Now, in this case, all I want to do is cancel. You can you can like, divide light terms, right? So you just like the answer will be like x. Well, we already know what the answer is going to be. It's not hard to figure that out. I know, but I'm doing it again. That well, let's so. let's look at it. Okay, if I have four x's on the top and three x's on the bottom, mm -hmm. how many x's can I cancel? Three. I can cancel three from four, leaving how many left? One. All right. The long hand of that. x to the fourth over x to the third. Cancel, cancel, cancel. And there's one left. And it's on top. Why is it on top? That's positive. No. Because the bigger number. Blocks. That's where I had more to begin with. Mm -hmm. it's, it's as simple as if I'm canceling things out, my leftovers are going to be in whichever one has more. That's it. Then I can cancel four y's from six, leaving two. And that's going to give me, so I have the x, and then I have the y squared, and I get the same answer. Do you guys like that way better? Yes. I hate negative exponents. But I always tell my students, my first strategy is get rid of those negative exponents. Because so that's what's going to mess you up. Anytime you do it this way, you're going to get the same answer. Assuming you do it correctly, yes. <laughs> Whether well, you're going to get the right answer, that I can't verify. But if you do it correctly, yes. And, and that's part of, part of the confusion with exponents. Is there's not one right way. I mean, this problem can be done probably three or four different ways using the rules in different orders, and they're all correct. And that's sometimes the issue is, well, what's the best way? I think this is the best way, in my opinion. All right, so if we were to take something like um, 31, x squared y to the minus 1, all to the negative 3 power. So what do you think the best way to do this particular problem is? What do you think? Do you remember the exponent? Okay. But the issue is, what's the best way to get rid of that negative? I would multiply like... I would apply rule 3 here, power to a power. I think that's always something good to do first because, wow, that looks ugly and funky. Let's get rid of that extra parentheses and that extra exponent. So when we multiply a power to a power, we get x to the negative 6, 2 times negative 3, times y to y the, to the third, third, right? Positive 3. Negative 1 times negative 3. Now what? That's the answer. No, you can't have a negative exponent in your oh, answer. Oh, so you so have to so you you use the last... The yeah. x of the negative 6 is going to end up going where? Flipping so down. So we get y to the third over x to the sixth. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, anything to the zero power is... One. Oh. So, there one. Can, so there can be negative exponents in any answer. Except one place, which I'm about to do. Just hold on uh, before I get to that. Because I want to wrap up exponents here. Anything to the zero power is one. I thought when you get here, you are going to What's that equal to? One. One. Doesn't matter what's in here. 
So the zero power is one. So you will see on the test something, and you can see this in numbers 34 to 35, there are some bases to uh, zero exponents. Anything that's zero power is one. Now the one place, the one place where you're allowed to have a negative exponent is in a non-mathematical answer. The reason why I say that is because it's a scientific answer. Science people just take our math and do with it what they want. All right. So, you know, what kind of scientific answer, or what kind of problem would you have a scientific answer? What? Scientific notation. Scientific notation. That was kind of was helping you with the words. All right. Scientific notation. This is number thirty-six. So if you have to write point, zero point, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Are there nine zeros? No, there's more than nine. nine. Are there nine? Nine. nine. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two, forty-three. My eyes are not what they're used to be. It's kind of hard sometimes to count how many zeros. All right. So the point is you're going to move the decimal over. You guys tell me when to stop. Yes. All right, you ready? You watch it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stop. No. Yes. She's right. Why? Should, why do you stop there? Because you have less than ten. Less than ten. Because you want a number between more than one, but less than ten. There should be at least one. It could be. It could be equal to one. So one or more, but also less than ten. Now. Forget all those zeros. When I put my decimal there, what does it read as? 2.43. Is that between 1 and 10? Yes. Yes. If you would have gone one more and put the decimal here, how would it read? 24.3. Is that between 1 and 10? No. That tells you you went too far. Okay? So we know it's going to be 2.43 times 10 to the, and how many did we move? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So is this to the positive 10 or negative 10? Negative. negative 10. Now the way I teach students, is that one of the answers? Yes, it is. The way I teach students to do this is positive is big, negative is small. Just think of that word association, right? Positive numbers are bigger than negative numbers, right? So positive is big, negative is small. If you have a big number that you're doing scientific notation on, like 83 trillion, big numbers would have a positive exponent. Right? Small is negative. Very small numbers are going to have a negative exponent, and vice versa. Right? If it has a negative exponent, that means you should make a very small number. Right? So that's positive is big. and negative is small. Okay. All right, let's keep going through this because I want to, we've got uh, 35 minutes left and I want to get through this. Um, working with polynomials, so the next page, uh, 39 to 44. 37 is... Uh Thirty-seven is going to be B. Well, first of all, for, and again, for those of you watching at home, um, A choice A is twenty-two point five times ten to the seventh. Choice D is two hundred twenty-five times ten to the sixth. These are not acceptable answers in scientific notation because this is neither of these are between one and ten. They're wrong. All right, that's it. So I don't care how they may be equivalent to the answer, but it's not acceptable scientific notation. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about like polynomial expressions all the time? Yeah, so let's go through. So 39 to 44. Uh, basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. All right, addition, I mean, addition and subtraction of polynomials are pretty easy. Just remember with the subtraction, put a one in front of that second thing you're subtracting and distribute 
the negative one, right? And we saw that with an algebra problem earlier. So number 40, 9x squared plus 5x minus 6 minus 2x squared minus 3x minus 4. Think of this as a negative 1 and distribute. Mm -hmm. So that's going to change all the signs. Yeah. So that's 9x squared plus 5x minus 6, then minus 2x squared plus 3x plus, plus 4. Yeah. Combine like terms, 9x squared minus 2x squared, 6, 7x squared. 5x plus 3x plus eight. is 8x. And negative 6 plus 4 right. is negative minus 2. two. The answer is B. B, as in boy, yes. All right, one thing to be careful of, say 43. Squaring a binomial. Wait, you said the answer is B? B is in boy. I think it's D. For number 40, 49, right? No, 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 no 39. 40. 40. Oh, all right. Here's 40. I'm looking at the wrong one. All right, for this one, now there is a formula for squaring a binomial. That is the one thing that we teach that if you go on to get graduate degrees in mathematics, you will never actually have to use. Because you don't have to memorize the formula. You can just do this as 3m minus 2 times 3m minus 2, and then you can distribute everything if you want. Which is what I recommend. So this is going to be 9m squared minus 6m minus another 6m plus 4. And then you have some like terms. This is going to be 9m squared minus 12m plus 4. There is a formula that you can use, uh, a squared plus, 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 no, not plus b squared. That's where you're going to get in trouble. It's a squared plus or minus, depending on the sign here, 2ab, and then plus b squared. It's one of those things we like students to know. I find it very helpful in places, but if you don't know it, you can get by without it. All right, for the division, what's the trick when dividing by a monomial? This is number 44. You divide everything by, by 2, you get 2. What do you mean by that? Every term. Every. You're, no, you're correct. You're going to divide each term. What I recommend you do is literally write three different fractions. Mm -hmm. Split it up. Yes. So 8x to the 7th over negative 2x squared plus 6x to the 5th over negative 2x squared minus 20x to the 3rd over two, negative 2x squared. And then just simplify each fraction. I think this is the, by far the best way to do it. It's the most writing, but it's worth it in this case. So 8 divided by negative 2 is negative 4. Cancel 2x's from 7. Five up top. Yes. Uh, I'm careful, not three. But it's no. Six divided by negative two is negative three. Yep. Cancel two x's from five, leaving three. Okay. Now here, be careful. This is really a negative twenty negative. divided by negative two positive. is positive ten, and cancel two x's from three is going to leave you with x. All right, so watch your signs there, and if you split it up, I think that problem is a lot easier. All right, factoring. Let's talk about factoring. All right, if you see, um, first of all, what's the first step in any factoring problem? Greatest common factor. No matter what the factoring problem is, the first step is to try to take out the greatest common factor. 
Okay, whether you've done that or not, okay, take out a DCF, don't take out a DCF. If there are two terms, then you're going to consider your special forms, right? The difference of two squares, a squared minus b squared. a squared minus b squared, the difference of two squares, factors to a plus b times a minus b. The sum of two squares, a squared plus b squared, is always prime. All right, this does not factor. Mm -hmm. So x squared plus 16 doesn't factor. Why? Because, okay. Why? Factor, who said why? Factor the number 10. How does 10 factor? Why? So factor oh, is equal to five. Oh, why? I said factor 10, you said two times five. Why? Because, so, two, times is because two times five is 10. I mean, it's an obvious answer. So the question is, why is this prime? Because you, you cannot find two factors that will multiply to get this back for you. All right? Okay. If I ask you, does 10 factor to 3 and 4? No, why not? Because 3 times 4 is not 10. So no matter what you try to give me, it's not going to multiply back to this until you get to more advanced courses. But that's not until pre-calculus. That's like three courses down the road. But for now, it's wrong. All right? If there are four terms, okay, we'll get to the other easy one. Whenever you see four terms, what are you going to do? How are you going to factor? In the separate things. What do we call those things? Parentheses. Wait. No. They're groups of numbers. So we're factoring by grouping. All right. If you have three terms, if it's a trinomial, then you got to pay attention. What's the is the, the leading coefficient one or something different? If it's something different, then that's a different process. So looking at these problems, and by the way, I do want to point out that most of the problem, most of the factoring problems on the test have answer or the problems say identify a factor of the polynomial. The reason why we do that is we don't want you to multiply the answers to see what the and see which one gets you back to the question. So we being evil math people, we set up the question so you actually have to factor it and then identify one of the factors. Okay? I didn't understand that. Okay. So let's let, let's Let's do 49. Identify a factor of x squared minus 7x plus 12. And for those of you at home, the answers are x minus 3, x plus 4, x minus 6, and x plus 3. Notice that we don't provide you with the whole factorization. Because if we gave you both factors, then you could just multiply those factors together and see which one gives you back to the original problem. All right, so let's talk about this one. Because we have a leading coefficient of one, we can factor this trinomial by what I call the easy method. So we need to find two numbers that multiply to C, which is uh, 12, and add 
to the middle coefficient, negative 7. Okay, so this is uh, multiply to 12 and add to negative 7. Minus 3 out of 4. Negative 3 and negative 4. So we have x minus 3 and x minus 4. Those multiply, those multiply to 12 and they add to negative 7. So what's the right answer? Oh, what's, what's the right answer? A. a. It's going to be a. a. X minus 3 is one of the factors. But, I mean, what if... What if okay, no, no, what no. if we messed up and gave you both potential ones? We did not do that. All right. <laughs> All right, no, that's a valid question. All right, so... Obviously, that either x minus 3 would be a right answer or x minus 4 would be a right answer, but not both. Right. I can't give you both. All right. Any other questions on factoring or solving quadratic equations? 53. I think 53 is a good one for us to work on. That's got a little bit of everything that you need to know here. So 53, we're going to solve 5x squared minus 8 equals 18x. Now, first of all, it's important to recognize what kind of equation this is. And this is a quadratic equation because it's got an x squared. And how we solve a quadratic equation is different from how we solve a linear equation. And we did linear equations way back at the beginning. Linear equations is get all the variables on one side, all the numbers on the other. That's not what we do here. What do we do for, what, for a quadratic equation? We can uh, bring the 18 inside, like to the left. Get everything to one side so that the equation is equal to zero. zero. All right, but you got to look at it first and say, okay, this is the type of equation I have, so this is the process I'm going so, to use. I'm sorry for my question, but like, so if you had uh, an exponent on any equation, that makes it a quadratic equation? If, it has an, if the largest exponent is a 2, an x squared, then it's quadratic. Right. You can actually have higher exponents, and those have different names. And they're still linear? Like, they're not going to come? Uh, no, no, you may see, uh, let, let's go ahead and do this one and then I'll answer your question. All right. All right. So this gives us 5x squared minus 18x minus 8 equals 0. Note that I put these in decreasing order by exponent. That's important so you can factor it. Now this problem is different than this last one we did regarding the factor. Because we have a number in front. All right, we have a coefficient other than 1. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is we need to multiply. We need to find two numbers, excuse me, find two numbers that multiply to a times c and add to b. So we need to find two numbers that multiply to 5 times negative 8, which is negative 40, and add to negative 18. Now, my advice to you is give yourself 5 to 10 seconds maximum. I think 10 seconds may even be too long to look at it and say, those are the numbers. Now, I look at it and I see those are the numbers. But I do this for a living. I don't expect a lot of students to be able to do that. Once you look at it and it does not instantly come to you, like this one, some of you, it came right to you. You knew exactly what the numbers were. Great. So it's... If that, wait. No. Let me go, go through the process. If it doesn't come to you right away, make a list. When you make a list, go in order. So first of all, the product is negative. So what does that mean about our two numbers? Are they two positives, two negatives, or one each? So one each. One each, right? Because a positive times a negative will give me a negative. Additionally, because these add to a negative, is my bigger number going to be positive or negative? Am I going to have more positive or more negative amounts in my two numbers? More negative. negative. More negative. So that means if I list, say, 1 and 40, notice I'm starting with 1 because 1's at the beginning, 
Which one of these two numbers is going to be negative? The, the more, the bigger one. So I'm going to keep that second number, the bigger number, as the negative one. Okay. Do these add to negative 18? No. Nope. That's not it. What comes after one? Two. Two. Does two go into 40? Yes. Yes. 20. So two goes into negative 40 how many times? 20. Okay. In this case, negative 20. Do those add to negative 18? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are the numbers. Now, if that didn't work, then you would try. What comes after two? Three. Does three, but three doesn't go into 40, so you skip it, and you'd go to four, and you'd go to five. Because with some, if you're going to jump around and try random numbers in your head, there could be literally eight to ten combinations here. And you could very easily skip over the one you're trying to find because you're not organized in your thoughts. All right, so we know we have 2 and negative 20. So we have 5x squared plus 2x minus 20x minus 8. What is this process called? Well, sometimes it's called the AC method. Right? You guys have seen that, the AC method. It's also called splitting the middle term. The reason why it's called splitting the middle term is I took the middle term and I split it. We're not very creative with our names. So I split the middle term. Now that I have four terms, I can factor by grouping. So we group the first pair and the last pair. Now you gotta be careful with this negative here in the middle. This is still equal to zero. All right, whenever this middle sign is a negative, make sure to include it in your second group and then factor it out. So here we're gonna factor out each uh, parts or the GCF from each part, from each group. So here we can take out an X and we're left with 5X plus 2. Here we have a greatest common factor of negative 4. So when we factor out a negative 4, it's like dividing by negative 4, we also get 5X plus 2. Remember this is division. Negative 20 divided by negative 4 is positive 5 along with the X. And negative 8 divided by negative 4 is positive 2. Zero. Do we have a common binomial factor that we can factor out? Yes. yes, we do. And when we factor out the 5x plus 2, we're left with x minus 4 equals 0. So then we have the zero product or the zero factor property that if you multiply two things together and get zero as an answer, then one of those two things has to be zero. So 5x plus 2 is equal to 0, or x minus 4 equals to 0. And for the sake of brevity at this point, when we solve, we get negative 2 fifths and positive 4. And that would be the solution set. Now, if you can do that problem, if you can understand that problem, you can do any factoring problem and any quadratic solving equation problem you're going to see on the test. That has everything. Now back to your question is, could you see a problem with a larger exponent? Yes, but the only way it would show up is if you could factor out some amount of x, some power of x, either x or x squared or x cubed, to get it down to an x squared. You guys have not learned how to factor or how to break down polynomials with an exponent bigger than 2. All right, that'll come in the next course. You'll learn certain ways to do some cubes. And then really once you get to pre-calculus is where you learn the method to break down other polynomials. All right. All right, so 54... Uh, determining when an, a rational expression is undefined. When is a fraction undefined? When the numerator is over zero. When the, no, so hold on, say that. You may have said it correctly. Say it one more time. When the numerator is over zero. When the numerator is over zero or when the denominator is zero. Okay. All right? Different <laughs> language, but same thought. So when the denominator is zero, that's when the expression is undefined. So in this case, you have an x minus 2 in the denominator. 
you just write it down real quick. 54, x squared minus 9 over x minus 2. So this denominator would be 0 exactly when x is 2, because 2 minus 2 would give you 0 in the denominator. All right, same with slope, right? You guys talked about that with slope. Yeah. When you have 0, when you have something over 0 is when the slope is undefined. All right, so the answer here would be A. When x equals 2 is when the denominator is 0. Sorry, I'm coming off. How you got 2? Hold on, say that again. Can you repeat? 54. A rational expression or a fraction is undefined when the denominator is 0. That's the bottom. I know, but... Go ahead. Our denominator is not 0, so I'm confused. All right. Um, you just write. Okay, it's really it's a what if situation. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. What if my son runs out into traffic on I ninety five? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that really never happens, mm -hmm. but if he does, then it's something really bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's really a what if. What if this were undefined? That would mean that the denominator would have to be zero. And if the denominator had to be zero, that would mean x would have to be two. Because that's the only way to get a zero in the denominator. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes, I'm, I'm saying what if something bad happens? I said how, how do you solve it? You would just, I mean, if, if you wanted to do the algebra, you can just set the denominator equal to zero. And solve. So x, if x were 2, okay. then, because that's all the problem is asking, for which values is the expression undefined? This is undefined when x equals 2, because mm -hmm. that's when the denominator is 0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. We'll add 2 to both sides. Yeah, you can. Okay, okay. All right. Um, as far as the rational expressions, the uh, simplifying, the multiplying, and the dividing, 56 through 59. Now, dividing, we know there's a wrinkle, right? In order to divide by a fraction, then you keep the first fraction, you change the division to multiplication, and then you flip the second fraction. Some people refer to it as keep, change, flip, all right? Or you just multiply by the reciprocal. Now, whenever I teach rational expressions, and remember, rational means fraction. It's a fractional expression. There are two steps, and two steps only. The first step is factor. The second step is cancel. That's it. All right? Factor and cancel. So is there one of those you guys would like me to do 56 to 59? Fifty-nine. Okay. The first step is right factor, and the second step is cancel. That's it. All right. So we have x squared minus three x minus four over x squared minus four divided by x minus four over x plus two. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the division to multiplication. So this is x squared minus 3x minus 4 over x squared minus 4 times x plus 2 over x minus 4. So now all I want to do is factor and then cancel. I have to factor first. So you can just do that? You can just flip the operation in one side and that will make a... Well, that's the division. That's the definition of division. Is if I were to have 8 thirds divided by 2 fifths, this is 8 thirds times 5 halves. And then I would multiply. That's how you divide by a fraction. Oh, really? That's the only way? Yep. Wow. That's it. So now we're going to factor here. So we need to factor this first numerator. Numbers that multiply to negative 4 and add to negative 3 are x minus 4, x plus 1. 
The denominator, difference of two squares, x squared minus four, is x plus four, or excuse me, x plus two, excuse me, x minus two. And then we have the second fraction. Nothing there factors. So we can cancel anything on the top of a fraction with anything on the bottom of a fraction. So what can we cancel here? X minus four. X minus four on top, X minus four on the bottom. X minus X plus X plus two. X plus two on the bottom, X plus two on the top. And then you just write what's left. So this is X plus one over X minus two. All you have to do is just cancel light term, light term, and then you set it top to bottom. That's then, it. Then write what is left, and that's the answer. Yeah. If so you can simplify, you simplify, or yeah, you simplify what you can. That's it. So fifty-eight is x squared plus two x minus fifteen over x squared minus sixteen times x minus 4 over x squared plus 5x. So in the first numerator, we need to factor. We need to find two numbers that multiply to negative 15 and add to 2. So that's x plus 5, x minus 3. All right, 5 and negative 3 multiply to negative 15 and add to positive 2. The denominator is the difference of two squares, is x plus four, x minus four, right? What do we square to get x squared? What do we square to get 16? X and four. Times x minus four. What about that last denominator? How do we factor that? Uh, x. X. Yes, excellent. They got a common factor of x. We're left with x plus Five. All right, so what can we cancel? X plus five. X plus five top, X plus five bottom. What else? X minus four. X minus four bottom, X minus four top. Anything else? X. No. Ah, the X is a factor here, but it's not a factor okay. here. Because it's not X times something. Mm -hmm. That's yes. all we can factor. So we're left with an x minus 3 in the numerator, and then an x times an x plus 4 in the denominator. Can't you, just, can't you um, distribute the x? You could, but it's not necessary. In fact, it's probably not going to be distributed in any of the answers. It is. Is it really? Yeah. Then, then okay, then you would distribute. If you distribute, I'm kind of surprised it's like that. It's going to be x squared plus 4x. Um, for 61, we, we, we don't have any um, greatest common factors. So we well, I want to do, well, 61 is a little different. 61 is subtraction. And I want to do 61. Negative 4a plus 3 over 3a squared minus a minus 5 over 3a squared. This is a difficult problem. There are definitely some things in here that are going to throw you off. All right. First, what is this problem about? Simply. Keep it simple. What's happening in this problem? Subtraction. Subtraction of? Of a rational. Of a 
rational expressions. Mm -hmm. And rational expressions right. is a fancy word for fractions. So we're subtracting fractions. Okay? That's key. Just kind of keep it simple. We're subtracting fractions. In order to subtract fractions, what do we need? We need a common denominator. Excellent. In this case, we have a common denominator. Notice that we already have the same denominator in both fractions. I got a question that is more like something that we so is this that's this is not an equation, right? No, it's no, not an equation. We are not solving. How do you know it's not an equation? Because they're not asking you to solve. One, they're not asking you to solve. And what's the other thing? Have an equal sign. There's no equal sign. Exactly. So all right. All right? That, that's key. So, so factorization is not using equations? Uh, well, no, you factor when you have a nonlinear equation, when it's quadratic, uh -huh. that's when you factor. But not in this case, particularly. No. It, you may have to, depending on the problem. Sometimes the simplifying involves factoring. So yeah, see, like factor, like factoring is a way of simplifying. No? Yes, but for now, realize, again, getting to the essence of the problem, mm -hmm. that we're subtracting fractions. Let's focus on that. So we need a common denominator. So we have a common denominator. Okay. All right. So when you, once you have a common denominator, how do you add or subtract fractions? Well, once you have a common denominator, which we have, how do we add or subtract fractions? That's if we don't have a common denominator. We have a common denominator here. Uh, eight fifths minus two fifths. Oh yes. So just, mm -hmm. What do we do here? Just subtract, right there. You add or subtract the numerators. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Once you have a common denominator, yeah. then you either add or subtract, no. with, depending on what the problem is about, the numerators. All right. So. So that would be. Minus three and minus two. Minus and minus hold on, five. Hold on, hold on. Did I subtract those two numerators? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You, no. Like, you just you you did the operation. Just, just keep going. But what I wrote is wrong, and that's the tricky part. If this second if this second numerator is a binomial, meaning it has two or more terms, the most important thing to do is to put parentheses around those two numerators. Because then you have to take that negative sign, think of it with a one in front, and distribute. Yeah, I'm right. I know I'm right. <laughs> this is my job. So negative 4a plus 3 and then minus a plus 5 over 3a squared. Now in the numerator, we would simplify. Sometimes that simplifying is going to involve combining like terms. Sometimes that simplifying is going to be factoring to see if we can cancel. Right, because sometimes you've got to re put your fraction in the lowest terms. The way to do that is to factor and cancel. So here, we have negative 4a minus a is negative 5a. 3 plus 5 is 8 over 3a squared. And since there's nothing to factor in the numerator, we're done. And that's going to be the right answer. So you can't simplify that? No. Because you can't cancel an A because an A is not a factor of the entire numerator. Huh, what do you mean? If I had something like this, then you could cancel an A because it's been factored. But here, the A has not been factored out of the whole thing. Oh, so like the thing is like a whole? Yes. Please. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you may see a problem that 
you know, once you get down to this point with addition, addition or subtraction, can you factor the numerator to then cancel with something in the denominator? You should expect that. Okay, that doesn't mean that you automatically cancel something because it might be wrong. Okay, make sure you're doing it properly. All right, our time is up. I want to thank all of you for coming today. I want to thank all of you for watching uh, at home. And good luck on your session two exam.